you name the crime, and there's going to be a digital nexus to that crime. Or it could be anywhere from uh, homicide, uh, unintended death, espionage, terrorism, uh, maybe a major intrusion. There's not a case type that I can think of that doesn't have some computer component to it. When you think of a uh, hacked computer, you can think of it in terms of a digital crime scene. In almost every general crime investigation these days, you do have a digital evidence component. Anytime there's a computer involved, any type of media, cyber department is called immediately. Now the computer has gone from being an element of the crime to actually being the crime scene itself. In a computer forensics examination, our crime scene is the hard drive, the media. That's where the evidence lies. You have to take risk anytime that, that you're opening up a device and getting at its most complex inner workings. We go any place where the data is. We have deployments in Afghanistan going to particular spots where there might be media that we can that we can seize and process. They have to respond to something within minutes, if not sooner, because they may be chasing someone, they may be just looking for information on terrorist cell, and it's only going to be there for a short period of time. The war we're fighting today is very different, and I would like to do my part in trying to help fight a war that's not only physical, but it's um, cyber. Searching for digital evidence in a homicide case. Tracking the trail of a computer hacker. Protecting U.S. service members from internet fraud and identity theft. These are all a priority for Defense Department special agents fighting cybercrime. They're on the front lines of a new war being waged around the world. And the battleground is cyberspace. They support the growing DOD mission of cybersecurity, helping to protect defense computer networks and data. With a unique blend of training and skills in law enforcement, forensic science, and computer technology, DOD special agents and teams of cyber investigators are cracking computer codes and helping solve crimes. Whatever the cyber crime may be, DOD digital detectives are on the case. Nearly every NCIS investigation has a cyber dimension. The NCIS Technical Services Division provides agents with investigative expertise and specialized gear. There's nothing like actually going to a scene where there's people who have been brutally murdered, um, where there's a lot of uh, blood and, or a body that's been there for a very long time. There's a lot of smells that go along with that. In criminal cases, we have to understand what we're looking at with the body. The body is a crime scene in itself. An agent is an agent. Um, basically, we're all trained law enforcement officers uh, to commit to work criminal cases and to follow the investigative process to come to an end, uh, to help gather information, gather evidence, solve a crime. Computer investigations, computer examinations, they often lead to strategies of, of perpetrators, where they're going next. New developments in the Camp Lejeune Marine who is suspected of murdering pregnant Lance Corporal Maria Lauterbach. An Onslo County, North Carolina grand jury indicted Marine Corporal Cesar Armando Lorian Thursday on five charges. Cesar Lorian was already absent without leave. So the, the fugitive team seized the government computers in an effort to see if there was anything, any communication whatsoever to maybe the whereabouts of Caesar Lorian or the death of Maria Lauterbach. Whatever you do on the government computer, we can examine for criminal activity. However, in this case, we also got authorization from the commanding officer. Our job as computer forensic examiners is to extract that information from those computers, provide it to a case agent that can use that for legal proceedings. We look at things like recently accessed files, photographs, documents that were typed, communications. I uh, examined that computer and specifically examined Cesar Lorian's computer profile for any activity. And I found information on his internet history. As you can imagine, we were in a, in a situation where we needed to get information right away. Since he was already on the run, I was looking for specific dates. I wanted to get the last activity that was conducted on this computer. There was a specific MapQuest search for his residence to a particular hotel in Raleigh, North Carolina. He was doing Google searches for um, defense attorneys on, on how to conduct a homicide investigation and uh, job opportunities, classified ads in, in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. That gave the fugitive team 
something to act upon, a viable lead. A three-month manhunt for a Marine corporal charged with the murder of a pregnant fellow Marine has ended with his arrest in Mexico. That's the beauty of a computer examination. It gives them insight onto their activity, every aspect, where they may go next. We testified in court as far as the MapQuest searches, the Google searches and what he was doing. And I think it, um, it helped the jury as far as um, premeditation and the deliberation of, of Cesar Loy and, and his intentions. Traditional forensics is going into a room and actually examining the room and um, finding evidence. However, in a computer forensics examination, our crime scene is the hard drive, the media, and that's where we extract the information from. And that's where the evidence lies. In April 2008, in a Hampton Roads neighborhood, a female was found in her home. Her father came home and found her dead. It looks like somebody tried to show her um, arms were tied behind her back. The female was a daughter of a, a Navy sailor. She was half dressed and bound, uh, laying in a pool of blood. NCIS Norfolk field office and Portsmouth uh, Police Department opened up a joint investigation. Because it was such a heinous crime, we threw a full spectrum of law enforcement uh, resources at this to ensure we caught the assailant. Uh, one of those law enforcement resources was computer forensics, which NCIS Cyber Department brought to the table, and we obtained the victim's computer. We discovered uh, numerous email chats, communications, and one individual stood out, a Navy sailor, who was interviewed, uh, and he was actually later cleared of the charges of sexual assault and murder. The investigation went on. A few months later, a suspect was identified and interviewed. He had a computer, so we were again called to conduct forensic examination on the computer. It had email communications and, of course, chats. What the individual said was he had done a very bad thing and no one will understand what happened. It doesn't mean anything until it's actually brought together by the forensic examiner and identifying the person connected to the individual who put that information on the computer. The individual pled guilty and he was sentenced to 42 years for sexual assault and murder. Cyber touches every part of everything that NCIS does. We've kind of grown uh, from a couple of guys in the Washington area to now we're worldwide. As the internet grew, so did the crime involving computers and other electronic media. In some cases, obviously, the digital evidence can expedite a, you, you solving a case. And other times it can, yeah, it certainly can slow it down, but it's an essential part of pr producing a, a solid case that you're going to take to court. We have to have the ability to get evidence wherever it lies. And we have to have every agent running an investigation understand where digital evidence may be, because digital evidence or just plain evidence, there's really not any difference. If it, it could be the linchpin to the entire investigation, and often it is. I've done computer support to a murder for hire investigation. Uh, an individual had hired a uh, hitman to kill his wife, and um, we caught him. Things like text messages, email now, all that data links back into that communication that was necessary to prove a, a very serious criminal conspiracy. The end result of if we did not investigate and did not succeed in that investigation would have been death. With any data, we're looking for to place the suspect at the uh, location of the crime. A lot of the investigative techniques with cyber investigations are simply an evolution of the, the general criminal investigative techniques. The, the hard drive is just bits and pieces. It's similar, again, to a going into a room and doing traditional forensics. You're not bringing the whole entire room to court, but you're bringing the evidential pieces to court. Almost every device you have today is supported and contains digital media. 
which might be relevant to a, an investigation and operation. If it's electronic, we've seen it. Uh, mobile phones, a few years ago, we saw very few of them, but now uh, everybody carries them. They take them to the war zones. So it can be voice recorders, it can be gaming systems, computer systems. So the range of media is, is vast, and the amount of storage that we have to process is, is unbelievable nowadays. We have to place the suspect actually at the uh, keyboard of a computer or actually in the possession of the, uh, the equipment. A duplicator, a dossier kit. It actually takes a physical image of the uh, hard drive. It, just a uh, sound means of actually looking at the data without actually changing the data. The hash is a, basically a mathematical value representing the, the actual data on the hard drive. It basically can tell you down to a point that nothing's been changed on that hard drive. One of the biggest things right now is actually uh, GPS locations. Um, it's on everything now. It's on cameras, it's on cell phones, and depending on those images, there are also geolocation XF data on the images, which we can actually incorporate into Google Maps and show us exactly where those pictures were taken. Say if someone took a uh, picture of a cr crime that happened or, or shot a video of a crime, we can actually pinpoint where that, that crime took place and what time the, the photo was actually taken so we can actually put the person at that location. With any data, we're looking for to place the suspect at the uh, location of the crime. We've had some uh, pretty malicious things happen. Uh, laptops have been thrown on the ground um, by the uh, suspect and we have to you know, try to pull the data off these hard drives that have been bashed around a little bit. Each service has an inherent capability and then you know the cases that they want to send here uh, they send to our Defense Computer Forensics Lab, which is probably the world's largest accredited digital forensics lab. We must continue to be in the forefront of discovering new tactics, tools, and procedures that support the total force. Digital forensics is the um, science of uh, retrieving or finding and discovering uh, things that might be relevant to an investigation that might be housed on some kind of computer or something that uh, holds digital media. We get evidence in or we get media in and it's in a poor condition, either because it's come from the uh, war zone or it's just come from the, the uh, community here in the U.S. or abroad and it wasn't taken care of or it was damaged in transit or the individual damaged it in an attempt to cover it up. Typically, uh, I'll take, if it's a computer, I need to get the hard drive out of it and make a copy of that hard drive, what we call an image. You have to try and extract all the information off there that you can. Um, I'm learning new things every day on the significant data that can be on a hard drive of a PlayStation or um, the memory of a cell phone. It's a pretty good mix here uh, of technology, young folks, and the experience of investigators. They think outside the box and they're very, very uh, creative in the solutions that they come up with. My job at the lab is to bring damaged or otherwise inaccessible digital evidence into its most useful state of functionality. There may be deleted items, there may be items that are years and years old, and our job is to get as much of the original data back as we can. We are trying to recover everything um, nothing is unimportant. We have a machine that has been developed that assists in removing the newest types of microchips. It's a physical process. You can't really do it if your hands are shaky on a bad day. It, it can definitely go wrong because just like in anything else, maybe you'll, you'll pull the, the chip off the board and it, it just doesn't come off quite right. You have to take risk <clears throat> anytime that that you're opening up a device and getting at its um, most complex inner workings, but um, we don't take unreasonable risks. I've gotten hard drives in with bolt holes in them, and some of the hard drives, the storage media is platters that are made out of glass, so bullets and glass obviously don't mix very well. We've had hard drives that have come in that have been run over by trucks, ones that have been recovered from the bottom of the ocean, the, the, the murkiest waters, the, the most disgusting situations that you can imagine, and that's our job is to get that evidence back. I had a couple of hard drives come in that were submerged um, 
they were so badly damaged there was even like a dead water insect inside of one of them. One of them was extremely damaged. It had mud even on the inside all over the platter and things like that. The first time that I saw it, I kind of thought, well, this is kind of a waste of time, but might as well give it a shot. I was able to get my hands on basically what looks like a giant toothbrush that is a sonic scrubber. And so I gave the whole thing basically a good spray down with a, a miniature pressure washer. I'd spent months working on this thing. When I powered it on, have it hooked up to the machine and it's recognized, obviously. Um, there's the aha moment that, hey, it worked. We work many cases where people try to destroy the computer, the hard drive. Um, it may look damaged, but, but when you go to the specialist at the guys at uh, DC3, they're able to take that type of evidence that may look like there's no way you're going to get anything off of it. And you may not get everything, but I have, even a little bit of information can send you in another direction or help uh, solve your case. We can help them connect all the pieces together and say if they're tracing down a, a kidnapping and trying to ascertain who, who actually did it or whether it was premeditated, the fact that someone may have used their computer to look something up on MapQuest and have mapped something and us being able to find those traces and connected to the fact that they synchronized it with their phone and then passed it on their phone helps build that case that it was a premeditated act. Laying them on the side, then we'll verify that all the parts are taken out. Once that's been verified, we're going to have the slide up here. They're going to be putting the system back together. We have a tremendous academy, the uh, Defense Cyber Investigative Training Academy, and they train all the criminal and counterintelligence investigators in the Department of Defense on how to run cyber investigations and how to do digital forensics. Call one of the instructors, we'll verify that everything's out, and then I'll start the timer. They're gonna pick up the uh, basic technology foundation. They're gonna pick up the means to investigate it. They're going to pick up uh, the means to extract data, and they're going to pick up the means to potentially detect the fact that somebody's you know, trying to get into a hardened network. The looks good, car looks good, the powers are connected, floppies in there. If they're going on scene, they don't want to ruin a piece of evidence. The techniques of taking a, a computer apart and putting it back together, that it showcases the, the fact that they're com comfortable with the knowledge, so that they can speak about it plainly and clearly. Now what did, exactly do you mean by no anomalies when you made that comment in your notes? There is an inventory of the items that were seized by the agents executing the search warrant. Is that not right? Where in attachment B does it list a thumb drive? When the agents or the examiners examine computer data, they're not examining the original evidence. They're examining a complete copy. There's a, a web page that provided the instructions on how to make ricin, um, as well as the documents listing the ingredients that were needed to make ricin. This web page and that document were created on 5 November of 2008 on this computer. It's important for the uh, investigators to be able to establish that the evidence that was, was examined was exactly the same as what was seized. And as long as they can enunciate how that was done so as to not change the evidence, and it was done with tools that have been tested and verified to be forensically sound, then they can in have that evidence introduced at trial. Provided with image files from the uh, hard drive of the desktop, as well as image file for the thumb drive. It's Im important not only to be able to find the evidence, it's also be able to, important to be able to explain what it means, how the scientific process works, that it's accurate, that's reliable and repeatable. You know, that's one of the many functions, is to clarify from a legal point of view, are we permitted to do this exam under these conditions, or do we need to reevaluate? You, know, you own your mistakes. Mm -hmm. so. Clarify them and move on. I mean, that's part of what this is all about. We've got a, a number of brilliant people who know an awful lot about computer forensics, but they have to be able to talk to people who are not familiar at all with that science and be able to, to explain to them in detail why that evidence is worthy of belief, what it means, and how it applies to the particular issue at trial. And that's the benchmark. We try to get everybody at that point where they're a certified computer crime investigator. You obviously want someone who has some technical knowledge or technical interest. You have to be able to talk to people, you know, do the interviews, be able to get that information. And so we constantly struggle with trying to find that right combination of a person that can run a case, can, can, can carry themselves well, and have the technical aptitude to, to be able to handle all the different intricacies of running a cyber investigation. 
the bad guy is different depending on where the bad guy lives. Some, in some parts of the world, uh, people don't like the United States. So they're going to do what they can to destroy. There's definitely a, uh, a very complicated world out there when it comes to computer networks. And we have always been one of the prime targets. It is a dynamic field. And the bad guys are always leveraging new technology uh, for evil. It, it always has been and it always will be an arms race. As we figure out how to defend better, they're going to try to figure out how to attack better. The truth is, cyber is the great equalizer. No longer are we just fighting a war on the ground, sea, or in the air. We're fighting in cyberspace. These invisible battles are taking place right now. The Computer Crime Investigative Unit, also known as CCIU, is the Army's only organization for conducting criminal investigations of computer intrusions and related malicious activities that are targeting Army networks. When I first got into this business uh, over 10 years ago, the bulk of the computer intrusion incidents we were seeing were coming from what I would call recreational hackers. But we've seen a shift somewhat uh, with more state-sponsored hacking activities where the focus is on intelligence collection. Uh, those types of things worry us because it's a, a very driven, uh, dedicated type of adversary who is, is looking for sensitive or classified information that could undermine, in our case, Department of Defense or Army activities. Cybercrime is one of those truly borderless crimes. There are many types of obfuscation, uh, many ways that computer hackers can disguise where they're coming from and who they are. We, do, we generally look at the, uh, from malware. In general, malware is just software is designed to be malicious. Steal identity information, compromise accounts, uh, destroy computers. Once we identify them, we're able to try to figure out what, they, what it's doing, what processes it's doing, uh, where did it come from. We, we had an Army computer, and what was on there was some very interesting malware, and it was designed to hide and, and propagate through the network. The, the computer itself wasn't what you would consider a, a workstation. Uh, it was actually a printer. And once a person, the bad guy, identified it as vulnerable, they took over the computer and used that as its launching platform. Well, they were trying to take over as many computers as they can and steal information. Steal as much information about the U.S. government as possible. It took some time, but yes, we were able to trace him and, and fully identify the person. We were not able to extradite him to the U.S., but we were able to prosecute him in the foreign country. I think understanding how the uh, bad guy would think and operate does bring um, brings a nice edge to the table. Uh, you can think like, if you think like the bad guy, you can figure out what they did. Uh, at least where it comes from malware, if they're going to hit the U.S. Army, they're going to hit other organizations as well. I focus on intrusions. Intrusions an uh, incident involving uh, hacking against one of our customers' networks. We're hopefully uh, helping to secure uh, government systems, keep our information safe. It's helping them understand the threat that they're up against, um, and helping them understand what portions of their data have been compromised. The attackers are, are becoming a little bit more stealthy. They're becoming a little bit more sophisticated in making sure that they don't get detected. We're looking for anything that exposes their tradecraft or anything that exposes their identity. Oftentimes, uh, malware authors will leave little breadcrumbs, essentially, in their code that help, us te help tell us a story. So we may be able to tell people as in the community that uh, there's a certain bit of tradecraft they should be looking for. And even when we are able to detect them, Analyzing their tradecraft, analyzing their tools has gotten a little bit more difficult over time. Typically, everyone makes mistakes. Everyone's human. And, and the adversary isn't necessarily intimately familiar with, with the techniques that we sort of keep uh, close to chest and we sort of keep, uh, you know, secret a little bit. It's not, you know, it's, it's something we keep to ourselves because we know that if it were to be exposed, it would be countered. We are the Air Force's front line of defense against criminals, spies, and terrorists. Part of our charge is protecting the Air Force from threats. The Air Force networks are, are often under attack from a variety of different sources. There's criminal elements that want to get in, and sometimes there's automated attacks. 
the bad guy is different depending on where the bad guy lives. Different groups will operate in different countries. I mean, some of them know that they are in a very hard place to get. And so they'll act a little bit, perhaps a little bit more uh, uh, aggressively. So if you're going against somebody who is a U.S. citizen, he's going to probably operate a lot different with a much different mindset. You have a, an Air Force base of personnel that are becoming more comfortable using computers. And then you add to that that the Air Force is also becoming more comfortable with using computers and executing their mission. Add to that the fact that criminals are also relying more and more on the use of computers to collect information on people, to maybe steal the information from somebody over a computer connection. And so that just makes our job more challenging. There's a lot of personally identifiable information um, on Air Force networks. We have to safeguard all that personal information. That includes birthdays, social security numbers, names, identities. And whenever we have an intrusion into that, that kind of data, it's my responsibility to work that back and figure out where it went, damage that might, be, might have occurred. The Air Force relies on us not just to get people thrown in jail, but to make sure if people, Air Force people are protected and that the missions can be accomplished. The Air Force is not a unique target. The things that are probably happening on an Air Force network are being seen at other locations. On occasion, if a uh, network compromise were to occur downrange, uh, we certainly have the capability to deploy personnel to preserve and collect and analyze that digital evidence. Because we have personnel with a very specialized skill set in terms of digital forensics, we can deploy personnel to support uh, general crimes investigations, counterterrorism investigations also. We have an ongoing mission in Afghanistan. And we do go out in a consultation role where we do advise the warfighter on secure communications. And we also go in a proactive role as far as going to particular spots where there might be media that we can, that we can seize and process. That's part of our mission, supporting the global war on terrorism. They have to respond to something within minutes, if not sooner. So the, the information they may derive from a computer, for instance, they're deriving it right then as they've went through the door and potentially you know, already thrown in flashbangs, went in firing, seized a computer or a phone, and they have to get data on it to immediately move to their next point. Our, our responsibility to our downrange component is to make sure that we're providing the threat information to the commanders to protect the forces that are conducting the mission. So I still get a large amount of satisfaction when I can tell a commander, I know exactly what was done to your network, I know exactly how your people were targeted, and so that they, they can make sure that stuff, that those events never happen again.